Good evening, everyone. I'm Kara McCarty, Curatorial Director at Cooper Hewitt, and one of three curators of uh, the exhibition, The Road Ahead, Reimagining Mobility, which most of you know is on the third floor uh, through the end of March. Um, if you haven't seen it, I welcome you back to the museum, and please tell your friends, colleagues, um, uh, strangers about the exhibition um, to come and see it because uh, it's really it's been it's up for a shorter time than most of our exhibitions but it's had a lot of attention and as you all know I think that's why you're here tonight it is such a hot topic and uh, we are thrilled to be able to be a player in this and help to hopefully um, um, move the discourse forward or help to create more discourse by bringing together a constellation of projects, research um, that cover different aspects um, of the, of the uh, future of mobility. I would like to take a moment um, to thank our exhibition sponsors. The Road Ahead is made possible through the generosity of the Aaron Krantz Fund, Barbara and Morton Mandel Design Gallery Endowment Fund, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, and the August Heckscher Exhibition Fund. And before we start with tonight's program, I just want to say this was another really energizing day at Cooper Hewitt. Um, thanks to one of our panelists who is here, uh, Mike Milley from Design Group Design, BMW um, Design, BMW Group Design Work, sorry, um, came for the panel, but he also spent the afternoon with high school and college students, really introducing them to um, ways designers think uh, about projects, and of course, and, um, this was the focus was on mobility. They started with a tour of the exhibition, and then came down to our design studio, and to a standing room only space. I understand where Mike had to sort of hide in a corner, um, but the students were coming up with new ideas for interiors for autonomous vehicles, streetscapes when we don't have so many cars on the streets, and I understand. Uh, the results were really quite uh, impressive and imaginative. So uh, one of the many design prep programs here at the museum. And tonight uh, we are delighted to have a wealth of expertise with us, four inspiring leaders in transportation design and safety who will help us explore how future mobility will necessitate designing new roads, new rules of the road, probably new roads too. Um, ben Ebel is chairman of the Michelin Challenge Design Program and currently serves as user experience design director at the Michelin Customer Experience Lab in Greenville, South Carolina. Ben's many contributions at Michelin include work on the Twheel non-pneumatic tire wheel solution, the Acorus flexible wheel, and the design of multiple global tire lines. In addition, he developed the Michelin Challenge Design Program which is the premier global mobility design competition, boasting over 14,000 entries from 134 countries. Wow, I was right. <coughs> Jacqueline Killian, Gillen is President Emeritus of Advocates for Highway and Auto Safety. Under her leadership, Advocates has become one of the nation's premier highway and auto safety, safety organizations, influencing federal, state, and local transportation safety policies and laws. Jacqueline has worked in senior policy positions for the United States Senate, the U.S. Department of Transportation, as well as three state transportation agencies, New Jersey, California, and Ohio. She is an expert on numerous transportation policy issues, including autonomous vehicles and self-driving technology, motor vehicle and motor carrier safety, occupant protection, teen distracted and impaired driving, as well as bicycle and pedestrian safety. Mike Milley is a director of foresight and strategy at BMW Group Design Works. He leads a cross-disciplinary team that brings the future of li to life at the intersection of research and strategy. Mike has been an enthusiastic catalyst for design for over 20 years, answering the question, what's next? for some of the most innovative global brands. Prior to joining DesignWorks, he was the founding global director of Samsung's Lifestyle Research Lab, a forward-looking think tank 
that used human-centered, human-focused foresight to envision product opportunities across Samsung's markets. And Mike has been a great friend of Cooper Hewitt. Henry Greenidge, unfortunately, is unable to join us tonight. He was attending South by Southwest, and um, his plane uh, got stuck, so he's very sorry uh, he could not attend tonight's uh, discussion. This esteemed group will be in conversation with Joan Claybrook. I had the great pleasure of meeting Joan in, in January of 2017 at the Detroit Auto Show. Uh, when we were embarking on research for this exhibition, and she impressed me to no end at that moment. She was standing on this very long stage um, with a lot of men, um, including the director, I mean, the, 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 the governor of Michigan, two senators, a senator from Ohio, and several car manufacturers, and she was the only woman and really held her own. So. I made a beeline for her afterwards and said, we must have you at Cooper Hewitt. Uh, Joan is a former president of Public Citizen and a consumer advocate attorney, specialized in vehicle safety and efficiency, and more recently has been deeply involved in setting policies for autonomous vehicles. She was appointed by President Jimmy Carter to lead the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in the U.S. Department of Transportation, where she issued standards requiring airbags and the first federal fuel economy standards. She also initiated the new car assessment program, crash testing vehicles to provide consumers with safety performance inf information by vehicle make and model that has been emulated in Europe, Asia, and South America. At Public Citizen, she oversaw litigation attorneys who argued more than 60 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, doctors monitoring the FDA, forcing recalls and labeling of dangerous pharmaceuticals, oversight of federal energy and related environmental policies, enactment of ethics, lobbying and campaign reform legislation, as well as numerous vehicle safety laws. After what I suspect will be a spirited discussion, uh, we will leave 15 minutes for Q&A for all of you to ask your questions. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you. It's really a pleasure. Oh, sorry, good evening. It's really a pleasure to be here. I was told to treat this as a part of my body so that everyone could hear and it would get <laughs> properly recorded. And the first thing I did was to forget. <laughs> so um, this is a very instrumental moment in time in terms of mobility and transportation. Um, personal transportation in the United States has been car-oriented forever, and everyone loves to drive their cars, or almost everyone loves to drive their cars. And uh, now we have these new technologies and designs uh, that are uh, driving huge changes in mobility, uh, with major impacts in our communities, our existing infrastructure, uh, public acceptance, uh, government regulation, cost, and industry capacity. The advent of the driverless car technology is already forcing major business, consumer, and government changes. So my first question to this panel, and anyone can jump in and decide they want to uh, answer it and then we'll go around, is understanding the transportation design's impact safety, the performance of the vehicle, the environment, commerce, visual appearance, as well as community compatibility. How do we assure that design choices for future mobility serve our public and private needs. Who wants to jump in on that one? Jump in? Okay. Uh, thank you, Joan, great question. Um, as you heard from uh, the little description they gave, my background was in transportation planning, uh, and I have worked sort of at the federal level and on legislation in Congress and worked you know, uh, with states. And I think we are at a really important point. And my belief in, in philosophy on transportation is that it ought to be compatible and complement each other, the different modes of transportation, and not compete with each other. And I think that we are kind of at an important point right now where I was just you know, reading the other day that these studies are coming forward now that rail, uh, I mean, ride-hailing services are now growing 
exponentially. Exponentially, I know I talk a lot with my hands. Uh, while we have uh, public transit on the decline, and that's not healthy for cities at all when we're trying to achieve this balance where we have cars uh, and bicyclists and walkers and public transit because we don't want our central business districts and our cities, urban areas, clogged and congested with cars. And that's the problem you know, that we're facing right now when we have autonomous vehicles that are coming on and we have a huge growth in ride hailing services and we have these declines in public transit because we're not putting enough resources into public transit and bicycling and walking. Um, I just, I'm gonna be quiet, but I just came back from a trip to Australia and New Zealand and the cities there are just going gangbusters. I mean, Auckland, you know, uh, Christchurch, Wellington, uh, Melbourne, they're building subway systems, they're building light rail systems, and much to the chagrin of my taxi cab driver uh, in, uh, in Melbourne, they're taking lanes away from cars and making them uh, share them with bicyclists. And that's what we should be doing more of in the United States, and we're not. Uh, and it's, it's, we want the car of the future, we want autonomous vehicles uh, in order to address safety problems, but it's gonna be a bumpy road till we get there and we have to make some really important decisions. Um, so I think <clears throat> the, yes, is the first thing I'll say, I agree with those points. Um, you know, as a designer, my job is actually to ask questions. And once you ask the right question, the answer is usually pretty easy. Um, but you have to ask a different question, I think, than we've been asking 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. So my, if I was to say what, what would be the ultimate failure of the potential for all of these technologies we're talking about, it would be a lack of adoption. And so I feel like as a designer and as a member of the mobility community, it's our responsibility to reach out to you guys, right? To the people who are actually going to utilize these systems and realize that we need to design with the end user in mind. Um, and I, I think oftentimes we may confuse technology with the answer, right? Technology is a facilitation to achieving an end goal. Um, you know, I think Autonomy is a wonderful thing as long as we understand what we're going to address with it. And we see in our in our design challenge that different zones of the world have different beliefs in what autonomy is going to do. Um, in the U.S., we, we tend to see people wanting to address the 40,000 people that die every year on the roads. In Europe, we tend to see providing mobility to people that don't have mobility because of a handicap or advanced age. In China, we see the fact that when you build a road with 20 lanes and you have multi-day traffic jams, we got an inherent problem with our currently available solutions. And so autonomy is not an answer to all three of those things because it can't be the same thing in all three of those zones. But I think it can be a technology that if we ask the right questions can get us a lot closer to, to solving some of those core problems. But one, of the, one of the issues is that um, the um, auto manufacturers in the high tech industry now are investing huge amounts of money in designing autonomous vehicles. And uh, at some point, they want payback. They want people to buy these vehicles and use them and uh, buy the supplier supplies and so on. And so, um, in a way, they're driving the decision making uh, rather than looking at what we need, they're looking at what they want to sell. What do you I, think I of that? I actually disagree with that. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> as a designer working in the automotive industry, we start with thinking about the system that we are delivering solutions into. Okay. Right. So uh, I would say maybe the first hundred years of BMW was thinking about the car as a discrete object mm -hmm. that someone gets in and behaves either alone or with their family. Um, now we start with what is the ecosystem of mobility that this experience exists within? Um, how can we be responsible in how people transition? Uh, between different modes mm -hmm. of mobility, um, and how can we make sure that we are playing the long game in terms of creating sustainable and meaningful mobility solutions? Okay, but um, the fact is that at least in the United States, and I think less so in Europe, I don't know uh, as much about um, Asia, uh, at least not China, uh, um, they are pushing really hard, the auto companies generally, and, the, and their, their manufacturers and the tech companies, are pushing really hard to get autonomous cars 
onto the road. And my evidence for that is that uh, this last uh, two years in Congress, uh, the auto manufacturers and the high tech industry pushed legislation that would deregulate safety for autonomous cars. Hmm. A and so um, I, I envy your position because I see you as someone who is really looking at it the right way, but I'm not so sure that the whole industry is. Hmm. And you're very lucky to be in the position that you're in to be able to do that. I concur. <laughs> yeah, I, so I think, Joan, also, um, the reality is that in the United States, we're playing catch up. We have something like $836 billion backlog in highway, road, and bridge needs. We have you know, another $100 billion backlog in you know transit investments, so you know we have these cars, you know the autonomous vehicles, uh, you know introduce, but we don't have the infrastructure to accommodate them. And so then you're going to be asking you know taxpayers and local officials, okay, should we be send, spending your gas tax revenues to upgrade our roads to accommodate the people that you know want to drive in these autonomous vehicles, driverless cars? Because everybody knows right now they they do have a difficult time identifying you know or driving in snow or rain or identifying lines or traffic signalization if it's not perfect. Um, and so then you have to make these choices. Okay, if I have money, am I going to use it to repair a bridge or am I going to use it to upgrade, you know, our roads so that, you know, an autonomous vehicle can drive down it? And I think those are tough choices that people are going to face. Well, one of the other issues, of course, here, and uh, maybe, Ben, you have some comment on this, is that these vehicles, everyone's talking about them, but they don't really, they're not really ready for the road. Do you want to talk mm -hmm. about that, or are you are you ready to do that, or Mike, would you like yeah, to? Um, I mean, I can certainly give my personal opinion. Mike may have a more uh, yeah. company-centered stance on that. Um, you know, ready for the road is is kind of in quotes, right? And yeah. I think that's one of the real questions about the maturity of autonomous uh, technology. Is I, I think it was Elon Musk who said that getting to ninety-nine point nine percent capability for an autonomous car is really easy relatively speaking, but that last 0.01% is astoundingly challenging, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think one of the core questions that, if I can rephrase a little bit sure. there, is, you know, what does ready mean? You know, I mean, does ready mean that an autonomous vehicle is ready to operate in a geofenced city area where every other vehicle is also autonomous? You know, does it mean that um, it's only used on certain roadways by certain people on certain times of the day. I mean, you know, ready for the road is such a, a big a big question that I think it, it, for me, that's one of the core issues is when do we decide that, that, that that's happened? And, and it's a journey, right? I don't think, okay. I think there's a, a popular conceptualization that there's gonna be a moment where we flip a switch and every vehicle mm -hmm. is autonomous, yeah. level five, yeah. right? Um, the car that I drive every day has what I call autonomish features um, that yeah. are slowly giving me a more autonomous experience, mm -hmm. um, but nowhere near the full so sort of level So why don't you describe five. those? Uh, so things like I can have my car, um, I can designate a distance uh, that I want to follow the vehicle in front of me. Um, and, and it won't it get will any closer automatically. Than that. It won't get of, any closer than that. Exactly. So I can mm -hmm. keep my feet off the pedals and gas mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. while I'm driving in traffic, for instance. Um, so that creates a better experience for me as a driver. Um, those sort of steps are what are getting us to the place as a culture where mm -hmm. we're going to be able to accept the experience of autonomy. I think if you take a person, transport them 50 years into the future and put them in a level five autonomy car, they're going to freak out, <laughs> right? Because okay. we're used to literally being in the driver's seat. Okay, right? I'd like to define what level five is uh, uh, under the um, industry descriptions of uh, autonomous cars is one through five. And one is not autonomous, and five is totally autonomous. And that means no uh, steering wheel, no gas pedal, no brake pedal. The car is programmed to drive itself. And you tell it where you want to go, and it makes its way, and it goes there. And so when so you talk about might say level two is like the Tesla. Uh, right. right. Level two is Tesla, and that may be moving into level three. Yeah. Right. So um, it's... it's it's important to understand that, that the industry certainly understands that there's a, um, a variation between here and there. Uh, and um, I agree with you. 
uh, Mike, I agree with you completely. I think that we ought to move into this arena mm. with um, a gradual uh, improvements mm -hmm. in cars so that people get used to it, understand it. Mm -hmm. But as you say, if you put someone in a car with no steering wheel, <laughs> no, no brake pedal, mm -hmm. they will freak out. I would. There's a, I think there's also a really interesting topic around the idea that we you know, have a lack of equal distribution of autonomous technology in mobility, meaning now that, explain that I'm very fortunate that I get to drive a fabulous BMW yeah. every day. Not everyone has that luxury in Los yeah. Angeles, for right. instance. Right. So there is going to be an interesting moment where you know, there's going to be a transition in more autonomous cars than non-autonomous cars, or, or the, or the, or the average yeah. level of no, autonomous. Partially, partially yeah. autonomous. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's right. going to be a really interesting kind of ramp up. And mm -hmm. you know, we're starting to have conversations, speaking of thinking on the systems level, mm -hmm. of how are we going to address that? How is an autonomous vehicle potentially going to communicate and or interact with a non-autonomous vehicle? Um, are there ways that we'll be able to kind of retrofit non-autonomous vehicles so mm -hmm. that they can participate in the conversation, as it were. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really interesting design challenge that I, we're I think that is right the. Now. I think that's the key. I really think that you've just identified the key, right? Which is that the average car on the road in America is 11.8 years old, right? So that means that if on March 3rd, all of a sudden we snapped our fingers and all cars were only autonomous that were sold, we got 11.8 years before we even get to half. Right, you see right. what I'm saying? So right, I mean, right. yeah. I think that transitional period where we have autonomous cars coexisting with non-autonomous cars, therein is is the true meat of the discussion because that's where we're going to figure out how we want to to have these technologies coexist. Yeah. And I think that's really important. And I would challenge the auto industry, not just BMW, but the domestic industry here too in taking the technologies that we have. Like my vehicle has automatic braking. And I mean, that's a way to educate the public about these technologies, to introduce them in the cars, even if you're not at a fully autonomous. We do have some wonderful technologies that out there that are saving lives, lane mm -hmm. departure warning, automatic braking, uh, you know, the system you described where you can program what the distance is. Mm -hmm. And I think as more and more people get involved in that and familiar with it, then they will be more readily um, interested and open to accepting it. Um, you know, you heard the introduction of Joan on airbags. I mean, when Joan and I worked on airbags in 1977, you can only imagine when we were going up to Congress and getting them to approve this regulation and explaining <laughs> to a member of Congress that there was a safety device that, oh, by the way, was going to come out of your steering wheel, explode, and save your life. And they'd look at you like, what have you been smoking? You know, it's like, and now everybody comes to it accept. It was the 70s, right? Yeah, it, was just yeah. it was the 70s. Okay, okay. <laughs> What's your point? Yeah. <laughs> No, no. So, uh, you know, is that, so you're explaining to people about airbags. The same thing, Joan and I worked on the legislation that has made uh, rear view cameras standard equipment. I mean, anybody who has it on their car, I mean, who can drive or park or, or do anything without, you know, backing up without that rear view camera? And yet at first people were really reluctant. Oh, no, I, I feel more comfortable turning around and looking. And now everybody's very dependent on that technology. So I, I would challenge the auto industry, you know, don't wait until you have a fully autonomous, you know, vehicle. You should start introducing this technology now so that the public becomes accustomed to it. Well, I think that uh, one of the other issues that we need to address then uh, is what are going to be the rules? What are the rules of the road? Mm. Today we have a lot of rules uh, that many of you probably don't even know exist. There's some 50 or 60 uh, motor vehicle safety standards that auto manufacturers have to comply with for the cars that are on the highway today. And so many of the things that you take for granted weren't on the cars of the 50s or the 60s and even the 70s. And so... Um, the question is, what kind of rules are you going to have for autonomous cars? And one of the one of the stress points on this is that the tech people who are designing these vehicles and systems think that the government is in the dark ages, and it doesn't really have the capacity to issue rules that are consonant with the 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 new designs and ideas that are coming forward uh, with uh, autonomous cars. And I would have to agree with that, even though I'm a great advocate of uh, go minimum government safety standards uh, because the Department of Transportation has been completely underfunded uh, and has very few tech people uh, in its uh, auto safety agency at this point. And it's really essentially killing the agency by uh, starving it to death. 
And so um, for the future, we have to look not only at what's the capacity of the industry, but what's the capacity of the government to make this work right. Because as we all know, when there was a government shutdown, we are very dependent on the government, uh, even though we don't admit it some of the time. And so I'm just wondering what you all think in terms of how do we get from here to there? How do we get bring the government forward and the industry not looking at this as an adversarial process, but trying to figure out how to make it work? Uh, that's a really tough uh, uh, challenge, I think, for the future. You know, one thing that's happening in Los Angeles right now that I think is a really interesting model for this kind of conversation is um, a new type of public-private partnership, right? That the, uh, the city and county of LA are reaching out to um, tech, sort of uh, automotive um, and other industries in order to bring the best of those two worlds together, mm -hmm. right? That um, the sort of uh, larger scale problem solving vision setting that governments can do combined with the get it done agility of the private industry, mm -hmm. I think is providing this new kind of um, framework or pattern um, for coming to these kinds of, you know, developing these uh, regulations mm -hmm. um, and rules that you're talking about um, in a way that kind of, um, I think, meets both sides. Well, there, there are lots of stresses and strains in that because um, the whole concept of public-private partnerships sounds wonderful, but it often ends up without ever, anything ever happening hmm. that really ends up uh, controlling where you're headed. And so uh, it, it has to have a, uh, an endpoint that results in decisions that are things everyone has to agree to and comply with. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the problems with many of those partnerships. They don't end up there. Uh, the other issue is that I think that really we need to um, figure out how to address, and Jackie has raised this in part, is how do we decide how we're going to allocate our national resources on future mobility? That is a huge issue, because um, if you're going to have autonomous cars, you do have to fix up the infrastructure. No question about it. I mean, it needs to be fixed even without that. But, <laughs> but it needs to be particularly fixed with it. So how do we go about making sure that we're allocating our resources in a good way between how we transport people, how we get people from here to there, what changes are to be made in, the, in cities, uh, how air pollution can be reduced, uh, maybe can, uh, less use of gasoline, um, that's a really uh, tough, tough issue for the for the future. How do you all think that we should do that? Pulling you outside of your know, tech world. I didn't know this panel was going to be like this. I thought we were going to talk <laughs> design, maybe a tire or two, and we could just move on. Um, <laughs> I will say, <clears throat> in in my years in the industry, both in automotive and 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 now in in more mobility focused, I think I've never seen as much consciousness around needing to involve cities, governments, non-private entities than I do now. You know, I mean, um, we Michelin hosts a uh, sustainable mobility summit every year up in Montreal in June called Moving On. And it's specifically trying to bring together disparate partners to make some of these these things happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's everything from not just the BMWs of the world, but also you know uh, city governments, right? And you'll see now there are there are innovation officers for particular cities now. LA has one, Detroit has one, and so I think there's a recognition that this problem is too big for for any not just one company but one entity to mm -hmm. succeed in. And so I do see more strange bedfellows than I ever have before. Um, I, I don't think it's something that just from an inertia standpoint will take care of itself, right? I mean, someone has to make the hard decision which says this is not a choice. This is how you're going to address it. Um, but, but I think that, uh, I think the natural inclination of this issue is so vast that, th that it, it's being addressed more in that holistic way than I've ever seen before. Do you think more is happening at the state level and the local level or the national level? I think so, because I think that's where you're gonna see the impact mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. one thing we've talked about geofencing and, you know, the European movement where certain cities are going to eliminate first, you know, carbon producing vehicles and then cars, period, along a sliding scale. You, you know, that has impact on local uh, populations first. And so I think those cities and municipalities are taking that on as, 
ownership, which mm -hmm. is that we're making these decisions. We know there's going to be impacts. Boy, we'd rather not figure that out after we do it, right? Mm -hmm. We'd love to get in front of that. And again, it goes back to that question. Why are you doing that? What are you trying to solve? And so specifically, we, you can involve members of the public in those early discussions. You got a lot better chance to get it right. I was going to ask Jackie sure, that. Yeah, Jackie, was, what, what role does public opinion play in this, and how does the public opinion have an impact? I mean, we know that there's a lot of concern among the public uh, about uh, autonomous cars. There's a lot of fear and a lot of resentment in some places. But how do we get them involved to, to help plan our future? Well, John, I have to tell you, in the last two years, I always jokingly say there have probably been more public opinion polls on what people think about self-driving cars than almost <laughs> presidential choices. I mean, there's every month a poll comes out. And I think that the industry needs to look carefully at those polls because they overwhelmingly show that the public has skepticism and fear and hesitancy about the new technology, and with good reason. I mean, we right now the National Transportation Safety Board is investigating six uh, crashes involving uh, self-driving technology, and some of those crashes resulted in deaths. The woman who was crossing the street, uh, the road in Tempe, Arizona, with her bicycle and was hit by an Uber, even though it had a backup driver in it. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, there was another Tesla crash. And I, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's easy to dismiss public opinion by saying, oh, the public is always hesitant, they don't know. But if you look at the polls, it's across ages. In fact, I find one of the most interesting polls done by SAD, where high school students were asked to rate on a scale of one to five how safe they felt in uh, driverless cars, autonomous vehicles, with five being the safest. 55% said one, <laughs> you know, and this is our future, and they even are concerned about the technology. <coughs> Um, you know, and, and I think that that's why it's so imperative that the industry is really tries as hard. I mean, you're not looking for perfection, but you have to be close to it for safety because every time one of these crashes and there's a story on it, that only feeds into the public view that this is not safe technology. I mean, who in this audience tonight wants to get, you know, board a Boeing 737 MAX 8 jet? You know, well, no one does now because of the crash. And I think that, you know, has application to, you know, some of the driverless car technology where it's being introduced prematurely, it's being put out there, sold to the public, and, you know, it, it's not working the way it should. So I, I think the public opinion polls are really important and, and good barometers of where we need to go. Any comment? I think that's hard because... What's hard? It, that, that question is very hard, right, about which is, yeah. it goes to the point of when is ready, ready, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, so the question is that you know, there have been accidents involving autonomous cars. There are accidents involving non-autonomous cars every day. And so the, the question is when are you doing more good and I'm not sure when that inflection point is, but you know, the question is when does the technology get not perfect, but get better than the average driver? And is that the point where you want to you know, make it standard? Mm -hmm. and, and that scale is, is really a public opinion scale. You know I mean? That scale is really about when do you feel safer putting over that as opposed to, to having someone else drive the car? You know, when would I feel safer riding with no one than I would riding with you, Joan, you know, and, and I don't know. But, and it goes back to that transition idea, right, that there's definitely going to be a very long period of time in which um, I will be in a car that has a driver that is supported by these autonomous features, mm -hmm. right? So I can definitely very vividly picture a few rides that I've had in New York City this week where I would <laughs> prefer to have had a robot behind the wheel yeah. than the human being that was kind of driving. I don't um, think a robot yeah. could match the human being. <laughs> yeah. I'm with I you. think the taxi no. drivers in New York are fantastic. Not in right. terms of yeah. style and verve, I'll give you that, but there are some safety moments where I really yeah. clutched my pearls. Um, well, and uh, I'm looking forward to that long, sort of thoughtful transition that we have where I can feel that that driver has some um, technological support to help him or her drive more safely, um, to give him or her more information. Um, so that they can be making the right choices, making more informed choices, 
um, as they're doing the death-defying <coughs> task of driving in New York City traffic. Joan, I just wanted to respond. I, I think part of the problem is that we have the introduction of this technology, but we have a government that's taken a hands-off approach to hands-free driving. Yeah. And so a lot of the technology is being introduced. I mean, if you're in a crash, your airbags go, out, go off because there's a performance standard the government has set. They must perform and you know save you at a certain mile per hour crash and you cannot sustain any injury. These are the standards that cover collapsible steering wheels, uh, the rear view cameras. And right now we don't have that for any of the autonomous uh, technology. Mm -hmm. And so it's being introduced in a way it kind of reminds me, you know, in the FDA would never introduce or allow a drug to be sold without doing a lot of testing and oversight. Same thing with FAA when new technology is introduced on airplanes, but on autonomous vehicles, there is a race amongst you know a lot of the auto traditional auto companies and the tech companies to be the first one out there you know to claim it. And I think that sacrifice that safety is being sacrificed because there are no government regulations or minimum performance requirements, and it's kind of the wild west out there where you know some companies are responsible, but others are just trying to get the technology out there to recoup their financial investment. I think that that's a, a major concern, and um, uh, there was legislation last year uh, in the Senate which Jackie and I worked to defeat because it would have deregulated safety for um, autonomous vehicles, and we felt there was a much higher uh, responsibility than that by the U.S. government. And one of the things that um, is quite unique to these vehicles is the whole issue of cybersecurity, mm -hmm. and there's tremendous fear among the public uh, about cybersecurity, and for good reason. And that was completely ignored. Uh, these vehicles have electronics. Uh, they're really computers on wheels. And yet there was no standard, nor is there today, any standard to make sure those electronics work properly. And th that appears to be a problem th with this uh, 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 Boeing uh, claim that the electronics weren't wor aren't working properly. So uh, that's a, a huge issue. Whether the vehicle can actually see, in the in the Arizona crash, the vehicle didn't actually see this woman who was a, a pedestrian with her bicycle, and uh, so you have to have some kind of requirements for what the vehicle has to be able to see, as we have to when we get our driver's license take a test for what we can see, and so there's a, a huge number of things that need to be done, and it's a a major major uh, effort that is going to be required and major funding for that. So I agree with you, Jackie. I think that that's a. Yeah. That, that's I don't. A key I just issue. want to add one point on the funding issue, and and back to your question on how do you get design adopted. I mean, I'm a real pragmatist, and you know, money talks. And right now, most transportation is funded by excise taxes on gasoline, and the federal gas tax. And unfortunately, we're never going to achieve that balance of you know cars versus transit, while 86 cents out of a dollar is going to roads and only 14 cents out of the dollar is going to transit. So we kind of need to, you know, work on that. And there are even members of Congress now, they're talking about doing a, a multi-billion dollar infrastructure bill. And there are members of Congress who feel that, and some groups that, oh, we shouldn't be giving any of this money to transit, which, you know, all of us in the room would, you know, be appalled. Can you imagine New, New York tran or New York subway has something like seven million rides a day. Can you imagine if all those rides were in cars? I mean, nobody would ever <laughs> be able to get home or you know do anything. And so I think as far as promoting sort of the design in mobility, we have to look at how are we approaching mobility. If we're putting most of the money in roads and bridges, and you know everybody's playing catch up. You know, don't get me wrong. Everybody's trying to get the potholes fixed, but I don't think we're ever going to achieve that balance unless we have a more balanced funding of the modes. Right, that, that's a huge issue, and uh, the gas tax is also producing less income. Uh, and in fact, some cities are now, uh, or states are, are uh, upping the gas tax substantially because there just isn't enough money to deal with the backlog of, of need and also look at the future for what we have coming forward. And I, I would like to um, raise an issue, uh, sort of a tech issue for our two tech guys here, because we've been talking a lot of public policy, which is where I sort of focus my efforts. Um, and that is, 
it's not just a choice, is it, between um, a, a, an autonomous vehicle as we know it today, a car, and mass transit. What are the other options that you all see in the future? And some of them, by the way, are in the exhibit here. Uh, if you haven't seen, you should definitely take a look at it. It's been, it's been really inspiring for me to see all of the, um, the new variety of options that are mm -hmm. coming out there. Uh, it's happening in a very experimental way, which I think is really exciting. Um, also, potentially a little dangerous. Um, we've definitely <laughs> seen a, a massive, scooters. exactly. Yeah, scooters. Um, but scooters and everything in between, you know, every, every time uh, one kind of driver sees a scooter, they have this sort of, you know, get off my lawn, you kids kind of attitude. Um, every time I see a scooter, I think that's a person who's not in a car, that's right? right? Um, and so the more that we give ourselves the opportunity to experiment and explore and innovate, in those um, non-vehicular and non-transit alternatives, um, I think that we're gonna be able to create a sort of system of solutions um, that enable people to make the right choices um, for themselves and their personal needs because that amount of flexibility, accessibility, um, and sort of relevance for an individual is what's gonna drive them to adopting that solution. Well, you know, the, the new generation uh, don't buy cars, apparently, mm. so I'm learning. Uh, in my own family, they don't want to have to, the responsibility. They don't want to have to have the, to deal with the car, and uh, so Lyft and, and Uber and others have taken off. They feel it's much more efficient. They'd rather have a car pick them up and drop them off, and they don't have to worry about it. Uh, and uh, there is a lot to worry about when you own a car. A and uh, so we have that variation, mm -hmm. a and uh, then we have these little scooters. They're all over Washington. I, I presume they're all over every place now. They're all over the world. Too. They're all over the world, <laughs> and so people just stand and then they push a little button and they're electronically, uh, the electric scooter just moves ahead. And there are lots of other options. Uh, so um, it does seem to me that uh, this kind of experimentation is very um, powerful. And I think that there are gonna be a lot of changes. Do you have some thoughts I, on that, Ben? I, I agree 100%. Um, I think Mike earlier was talking about how you need to move to an autonomous vehicle, right? I think you know, we're all aware of mobility as a service, right? Which is where you wouldn't own a car, kind of the, the ultimate goal of autonomous vehicles is you call one on your phone, it comes and gets you, right? And, and we start to look at mobility as a service. And I think Uber and Lyft and, and ride sharing, that, that was the first move to that, right? No longer was it that, you know, you wanted to have your car for reasons that really didn't have to do a whole lot with mobility. Right, I mean, I'm, I'm still there. I, I, I'm not a very cool guy, but I think my car is pretty cool, right? So <laughs> it gets me about halfway there, you know? But I think that for a lot of people in the younger generation specifically, th they don't look at mobility as being an artifact of owning a vehicle. They look at getting where they want to go right. as being the, the ultimate goal, right? And is it, is it not? Yeah. I, for me, no. I mean, it's not It's not for all of us, right? I mean, there's the whole pleasure of driving a car that is related to getting somewhere, you mm -hmm. know, but it's the whole idea, which is it's the journey, not the destination, yeah. right? And that's a very different relationship with a, a way of getting around than I think a lot of people today have. And, and I, frankly, I think some of us, of course, not us, but some others of us may feel a little sense of longing about that, you know, about this relationship that's been defined by countless songs and movies and all of these things, right? I mean, cars are, are woven yeah. into our fabric. Right, and so right. to change that to where instead of being something that's a possession that represents something bigger than just moving to just being moving, boy, that's big, mm. right? And that takes those small steps. But I think that Uber and Lyft and this ride-sharing idea, um, frankly, I think those are the small steps that eventually get us there. And what about transit, mass transit? Um, I think that, that that is going to be where you're going to really have to involve government and municipalities. Because, you know, it, especially as mobility as a service becomes more and more convenient, I think it possibly could have a negative impact on mass transit, right? Are you worried about the studies that show that mass transit or public transit is declining as uh, ride hailing services has increased. I mean, to me, that goes against everything we're trying to do, like declog Jackie, the cities, Jackie. clean air, energy efficiency. And yet, you know, we're, we're promoting the use of single vehicle occupants, you know, driving around in cars. And I, I think that's concerning not only for mobility, but also for, you know, other values that we have. 
I mean, I, I think one thing is there's also an argument which says that as more vehicles as a service are on the road, traffic's going to get worse, not better. Oh, it is. Because yeah, it's cheaper it... to keep driving around than it is to park in a parking space. Right. Yeah. Right? So you're putting more vehicles on the road. So, I, you know, all the, guess what? All of these things, we're not going to get them right the first time. Yeah. Right? You get them right over time as you learn. You know, it's not learn to do, it's do to learn. And I think that that we're going to see consequences of this mobility revolution that we, we have no concept of yet. Um, How about and drones? that's what we're going to have to see. Drones, um, I mean, I think <laughs> from, a, from a last mile delivery standpoint, yeah. that would sure be nice. And, yeah. and apparently it's happening, right? Yeah. So there's not only the movement of human beings, it's the movement of, of packages and goods, which has just blown off the top of the earth. I mean, there's so much of that happening now. People go on their computer, they order something, they get it the next day. Who could ever have expected that, no. right? So you're right. There are a lot of things we can't anticipate. Would you like to comment on that? No? Uh, I'm excited about drones, personally. <laughs> <laughs> regulation, regulation, regulation. That's what I say. <laughs> We're going to have questions in just a minute. So uh, are, we, or are you ready for questions? Yes. We have five minutes. Okay. Well, we could stop and just... I think we should just stop and, yeah, I and think so too. the public get involved in this. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, sir. Wait a minute. Okay, I'm Olli Hakanen, architect from Finland. And um, I, I'm a bit amazed that how, um, how the vision, what should be done, is missing. How the what is missing? Uh, I mean, the vision, what, what oh, should reason. be done with mobility in future is missing uh, in the panel. I mean, uh, how, how come there be a question uh, that mass transit is not the answer? I mean, <laughs> autonomous vehicles will never be the answer without being having a role which is good for them. They are not, uh, they are not to be uh, given the um, master position of, of our future, because it's, it's mathematically impossible. And uh, I think the uh, autonomous vehicle is a good name, but uh, driveless uh, cars is, is just Punch of nonsense, according <laughs> to my opinion. I mean, it's good for no, the same, They're supposed to be the same thing as people describing them. I, I mean, but why, why, why would it be car? Why, why would it be like our car nowadays? What, what, what is that? Uh, why would it be like what? Uh, why it would be the automobiles we have today? If we are, uh, wouldn't, shouldn't we be thinking about the new architecture of mobility? the new system intelligence of the mobility. And in that sense, we must have a rapid, rapid, fast uh, mass transit. And uh, uh, we have already autonomous vehicles, vehicles which are uh, good for uh, taking people for the last mile services. Right. So, so, um, <coughs> We should, I think, and that's why I'm here in New York, because this is the place where the change should happen, that we begin to um, make people flow master plans. Well, I, I agree with you, and I think that, that uh, one of the problems is, is that Jackie has um, uh, identified is that there is a mass underfunding of mass transit, and uh, that's because there is no... <laughs> lobby group that is specifically um, uh, benefits other than a, a pretty small industry. Well, well, there are lobby groups. They, they just don't have the uh, political power that the trucking industry and the other industries have to put the more money into right. roads. Um, you know, and, and talking about, you know, why is, you know, Uber and Lyft, even in New York City, you know, there was just a report out a month or so ago and the your Department of Transportation Director, Polly Trautenberg, testified for Congress that, you know, it is discouraging to see Lyft and those services growing exponentially and people are not taking transit. Well, 
you know, you can sort of see it. I mean, I understand it too, you know. I mean, do I call Lyft and have them drive me in a pretty clean car, air conditioning, nice, or do I get on the metro system in Washington, D.C. where the air conditioning may not be working, you're crowded in there, you're stopping between stations and things. So I, I think you're right. I mean, we, the mass transit part of the equation, I mean, we have to make that attractive. Um, and, you know, not to dwell too much on my recent trip to Australia, but they're building these lines. They, they have congestion pricing. Uh, they want people to drive to the station, but then in order to come to the center city to get on their light transit or get on the subway or the trolley car, whatever. And I don't think, I think that's the problem is that we can't expect new design and transit when in New York City you're still struggling with trying to, you know, take care of patching your system. So the money does talk and I think that we need to put more money in those resources into transit and mass transit and light rail, you know, so that we're not competing. It's not, oh, I'm gonna take Lyft because it's so difficult to ride a subway car at rush hour. And, and I think those are kind of the political realities that, you know, we're not gonna change things until we change that funding. Well, that, and that's a huge problem. The uh, members of Congress from the Northeast always pushing more money for Amtrak and mass transit and so on. But you got the folks from Wyoming and Idaho, they, they're not really uh, too interested in uh, allocating a lot of transportation money to, to that. So it's, it's a struggle. And that's where the people matter. A and uh, for those of you who are speaking out today and, and for the future, think about what you can do to um, influence uh, you know, members of Congress. Um, there have been amazing changes in the last decade with the public speaking out on issues, and it's having a huge effect. And uh, this is, in my view, one of those. So let's have some more questions. Yes. Um, with, with respect to, <clears throat> a little selfishly speaking here, uh, our New York metropolitan area, I'm sure that you're aware that last year uh, the RPA put out their fourth regional plan, uh, a lot of which talked about centralizing um, all the transportation related issues under one umbrella and central uh, control. Uh, last week, the, here in the city, the speaker's office put out a let's go plan that talks about municipal uh, control of the MTA. Uh, first of all, two questions, I guess. First, have you had an opportunity to uh, take a look at the RPA's fourth regional plan? Have you also, and what your thoughts are on it? And and uh, the recent uh, Let's Go plan that came out of the Speaker's office, have you had an opportunity to address it? I haven't, because I live in Washington and not in New York. But um, I would say, let's get some plans and, and let's get operational. I'm, I'm a very operational-oriented person, so uh, one plan or another plan may not be perfect, but I think that we ought to get going with them. So that's sort of my overall. I think the focus was to have a uh, master plan for the entire city, which I want him to have a mic. Sorry. Sorry. But also increased uh, uh, access for uh, more uh, bike lanes, uh, walking lanes, parks, and so forth in the city. So. Plans are very, very important for transportation because it's ex very expensive to change roads, to change mm -hmm. transit, H hugely expensive. And so plans are good not only so that you use your money wisely, but so that you gain public acceptance and agreement. And those are th that's the most important thing I think any head of transportation in any government agency, local, state, national, can, can do, is to get plans designed for 10, 20, 30 years and uh, to get public acceptance, to go and sell them, get, make changes if they're not uh, on target, <laughs> and so on. Some other questions. Can we go to... Uh, Yes, you talked a bit about economic incentives uh, around transport. Can the panel address the question of like the cost, the financial cost of being lost, uh, lost in congestion? So I had heard something at World Bank estimates about the hour, the dollar per hour Huge. stuck in traffic. Yes. Yeah. Jackie, you know? I didn't uh, th hear. This was um, it, the cost of congestion 
uh, when you don't have a decent transportation system. Oh, it's and huge. It's huge. Yes. I mean, I, I, I was looking at information just in, I think, New York. It's something like $100 billion a year is what it costs you in, con in congestion. So, you know, as I said, you know, you, you want the new technology and vehicles. I mean, you know, Joan and I have spent our careers trying to get the technology to save lives. But I was also, you know, reminded uh, that, you know, you have a 90% less chance of being in a fatal or injury produced or having a fatality or injury by taking public transit versus being in your car. So not only do you have the energy efficiency, but you also have safety. And, and I pollution, know that, and pollution control. Yeah, and I know the auto industry and those that are strong proponents of autonomous vehicles say, well, you know, 94% of all the crashes in the United States in cars are the result of human error. Well, there are ways to address that, you know. Um, as I jokingly uh, said to my husband last week, uh, you know, com cars are becoming computers, and computers are programmed by humans. So you're not completely <laughs> eliminating human error. And last week, my computer crashed, and I walked away unharmed. You know, I don't know whether that will always be the case <laughs> if I'm in a car and the computer crashes. So. Um, you know, I, I think that there are issues that, and a lot of things on cost of congestion too. You know, you're sitting in your car, you're frustrated, you miss an appointment, and it, it's hard to quantify that, and it's hard to use that in some of the arguments over funding to say, well, this is what it's costing us not to put money into transit. I think it's also really interesting to think about as uh, autonomous vehicles become more predominant, um, what I'm gonna be able to actually do with that time. Um, that I'm caught in traffic, right? Am I going to be able to be productive? Am I going to be able to be creative? Am I going to be able to catch up on sleep? Um, <laughs> this is where this is where I think design comes into the equation, right? How can we sort of think about what experiences people want to have um, in these autonomous vehicles that they're not currently able to have? How can we sort of envision those and be intentional about them in such a way that we're able to get back some of that time potentially? Yeah, and you know, on autonomous vehicles, I don't want to sound like you know I'm really just critical and I don't want them. Many, many years ago, I did a, a research project on the transportation needs of the elderly. And, you know, the most isolated uh, population are elderly people who live in suburban areas. And when you stop driving, you know, and you don't have transit near you, I mean, you are stuck. And so I do see a need for autonomous vehicles. That would be a tremendous step forward in, you know, giving, improving the quality of life of older Americans and who can't drive. And disabled and disabled too. So I think there's a role, I, I think again, without harping, I think we need balance. We, we shouldn't have these modes competing with each other that one takes away from the other. And I think we have to sort of come up with that balance of walking and biking and scooters and cars and transit so that everybody you know, benefits from it. We have more question questions. The, we have one more question in the back. Ben, uh, thank you for addressing how some of us own cars for the pure joy of <laughs> driving. Um, so my question is about the future of design for people who buy cars who love to drive. Mm. And has automobile design reached a point where it has just evolved so much that the next stage is to take out the driver? Or is there anything exciting on the horizon in terms of car design or automobile design? And what is the future of that? So <clears throat> I, there's, there's definitely competing theories on that. Um, I remember last year hearing a panel discussion and one of the panelists who was a car designer said that we will look back on cars that you could drive today as we do horses, right? As which they're pure <laughs> recreation. And then another panelist who was an urban planner said, we'll look back on cars that you can drive like we did smoking in public. <laughs> so, so there's definitely different opinions on that. Um, I, I think that what you're going to start seeing is more specialization, right? I think you're going to start seeing generalized mobility, and then you're going to see really specific vehicles that are used for certain things. Lamborghinis. That kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and I think I, I think we're going to start seeing that, is that the people who, I think the majority of people who use cars to transport themselves are, of course, going to accept you know a, di a, a different opportunity. Um, but I think those of us that... W 
don't forget, there's 300 million cars on the road right now in the U.S., right? They're not going away. So I think you can probably pick one up cheap, you know, once the, all the <laughs> autonomous cars come out. So, you know, there will be opportunities, I think, for, for people to continue to drive. And where it may happen, frankly, is you were mentioning suburban U.S. You know, that, that's where I live, right? Yeah. So, I mean, my, my personal challenges are very different than I think a lot of the people in the audiences here are, and my experiences are very different. And, and I think that my, my area, which is very truck heavy, um, may be one of the last places where you see people giving up the ability to drive completely. You know, I think they see it as a, as a right and as something that they want to keep. Um, and so I think that goes to that question of, is it a federal question, state question, mm -hmm. city question? I think mobility becomes very localized. And, and I also would like to call out the gentleman here from Finland who, who asked the first question, and good on you for, for, I think, calling us out about vision, right? Because I think at the end of the day, um, similar to what you said and what, what Joan just addressed is, I mean, you're the one that has to be willing to participate in mass transit. You know, and, and, and where I live, I can tell you that mass transit is discriminated against. You know, it's seen as you use mass transit because you don't have a car, right? right? So, so there is this whole public perception built in, and there is also an idea which is, you know, we're not designing those systems to be a viable, um, I guess, a viable option or a viable choice. You know, it's just it's not doing for the consumer what it needs to do for that person to make that particular choice. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, that comes down to the end user, to the consumer. You know, when do they make that choice, which is, I don't need an autonomous car if you make that choice, because what this mass transit can provide for me is, is how I want to participate in, in moving through the world. You know, one of the other issues we haven't addressed, which is very relevant to autonomous vehicles, is uh, movement of goods mm. and trucking and big trucks. And there's a lot, and also delivery trucks. And there's a lot of emphasis uh, now in the industry uh, to uh, start there because it's more controlled. Uh, and um, because, for example, for large trucks, they go for hours of driving uh, without, um, you know, uh, having to do very much. And that's a better environment, if you would, for the autonomous uh, vehicle uh, rather than the inner city. Um, there's, a, there's a study going on right now in Washington, D.C. on uh, Ford Motor Company wants to do a test of autonomous vehicles in Washington, D.C., which I think is laughable because <laughs> it's uh, so, so difficult. Anyway, one more question. Hey, may I just reply? Because I, I also liked your uh, opinion about uh, mobility being localized. Okay, but you have to have a mic in order to talk. Uh, uh, okay, sorry, I, I didn't uh, talk to it. Okay, uh, but I'd, I'd like someone else to have a chance. Oh, okay. Is that okay? Well, I would wa just reply to we'll, him. Yeah. We'll find each other. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll okay, one more person. One last question. Sorry. I'm just gonna follow up. Wait a minute, you don't have a mic. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Uh, just was going to follow up on that uh, question that point you made about trucking. Mm -hmm. In the big cities, the, one of the projects I'm in the design world as well did a project on this. Your points about the, the multi-modality of these kinds of devices that we can create to potentially solve those problems. So it's not trucking in the you know, urban, uh, in the suburbia, but it's getting the, the, the services, moving the refuse, and moving people in cities and getting the, you know, the goods that they need and transforming you know, that mobility and answering the problem of mobility in the city with that multimodality of, of those kinds of devices. So I, I use that word device because I like to... You mean autonomous, that's what you're talking about. No, I'm talking about mobility as a bigger, you know... A bigger the question, bigger I Bigger question, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it, it is, uh, I know that uh, some cities have, and I think New York is part of that, have gone to having um, those kinds of services done in the off-traffic hours mm. uh, is another method. <coughs> You don't have a mic. Yeah, sorry, I took it from him. <laughs> you know, for those that live in the city, um, we, I live up the street, and if you know, you know that between the hours of like nine o'clock after after ten o'clock at night or in the morning. No, no, this is in the morning. Mm -hmm. Okay, the bus lanes after ten o'clock they're gone. Okay, so then then the delivery trucks come, then the car, the buses come for the school for the students. Then you have the delivery trucks, and it becomes a nightmare. So I, I was thinking more of refuse and also. Um, 
of uh, delivery of uh, goods to, to businesses. But that's, that's, that's the thing. When you start thinking about um, the different business models that are coming into place, like Amazon, and the, the way that we're trying, we're now s moving goods and services differently, you have to look at the bigger system. Of so course, solving right. the problem of the system of systems that not really uh, everybody has sort of had their own system and they're solving <laughs> their own problems as opposed to talking about the bigger problem. Well, I completely agree with that. I think, as I said, I think planning is really a, a crucial issue here and having some controls over how that's done. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure for all of us. I hope you've had a pleasure doing this. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for allowing us to be here.